So we are going to start with the book of Deuteronomy. It is the fifth book of Moses, the fifth book of the Old Testament, uh, and it completes these five books of Moses or the Torah. So we have uh, we have come a long way since we started with Genesis. I don't even remember when we started with it, but um, here we are with Deuteronomy. So let me ask before we get any further, everybody does have access to the handout, either um, one that they have printed out or they're looking at it on a device of some kind, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. Yes. So I, I got into my lesson and I was so stoked and excited this morning. Somebody said, Pastor, don't you have some handouts for us or something? And they were sitting in a stack in front of me, but I was just so excited that I forgot to hand them out. Anyhow, let us begin as we often do with uh, uh, any topic that we start really. Let's go ahead and do a, a big old knowledge dump here. What do we know about Deuteronomy? It's a teachings of Moses after the exile, after the covenant. The, the, that generation was found unworthy to enter the promised land. So they had to wander for 40 years for the new generation. So the new generation is receiving Moses' instruction about being faithful to the covenant, obeying the laws, blessings, and curse. And said, it ends on the last chapter of Moses going to the top of a hill, looking at the promised land and dying. So yeah, it is the... Uh... It's the teachings of Moses, and uh, Nick, you made an excellent point there. He has to recap these teachings because the generation that left Egypt, he, Caleb, and Joshua are the only surviving members of that generation. So the people who are about to claim the land need all of this teaching from God. So, yes, excellent. Blessings and curses, commandments, all sorts of good stuff. What else do we know about Deuteronomy? I had heard somewhere that um, in terms of going back to the founding of this country, the um, uh, a lot of the research and papers that led eventual to the Constitution, you know, there were a lot of, of they, they used a lot of, of um, they looked at philosophy and they looked at the Bible and, and philosophical writings and that sort of thing. But the one thing I heard, and I, I don't, I haven't verified whether it's true or not, but the number one book of referenced material of things written by the forefathers that led to the Constitution was the book of Deuteronomy. It might be a fun fact. Maybe it's not true. I don't know, but I heard that. Okay, well, uh, I will defer to you on that. That is that is news to me, but it who knows um, the the relationship between the founders and the Bible is fascinating to say the least. It is not uh, not nearly as simple as many people would like to paint it. So the the sources. Of the Old Testament, JEDP. So this is assume. I assume this is the source. For sure, yes. So we're gonna talk in another session about kind of the the theology of the book. What is the message about God they are trying to communicate through this book? And um, Nick, as you said, we generally believe that there were maybe four different sources for much of the five books of Moses. And this D source is the third source chronologically, probably. And we're going to touch on that in a little bit, but it has its own distinct flavor. And I think we're going to uncover some of what gives it, gives this school or this uh, source its unique perspective. It's um, we're going to look a little bit into its origins today, uh, but yes, the the J source that's generally understood as the uh, the Judah source, the Southern Kingdom, the E source uh, or Ephraim, 
the northern kingdom. J could also be for uh, Yahweh because the scholars who originally came up with the theory were in Germany and instead of Y, they used J. So J for the divine name, E for Elohim, which is just the generic Hebrew word for God, the D source, the Deuteronomist, and the P source, the priestly source. So yes, obviously the uh, book of Deuteronomy is where we really first start to get the influence of that D source. Absolutely. Anything else you want to throw out there for the, the common good and just kind of level the playing field? Because I got a lot of stuff that, that I learned about the book, um, which I'm going to share with you over the next several weeks. So we'll start with what do we call this particular work of the Bible? Well, in Hebrew, as the other books of the Torah, it is actually named for the first few words of the book itself. And if you turn to page 141, if you have one of the uh, one of these kinds of Bibles, or you just turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1, uh, in Hebrew it is called Debarim, which is Hebrew for these are the words. And if you look at your translation there, these are the words that Moses spoke. So uh, that's what it's called in Hebrew, which sounds nothing like the word Deuteronomy. Carol, could you share with us, please, chapter 17, verses 18 and 19? When he has taken the throne of his kingdom, he shall have a copy of this law written for him in the presence of the Levitical priests. It shall remain with him, and he shall read it in all the days of his life, so that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, diligently observing all the words of this law and these statues. So... It is very interesting that they are giving commandments about having a king when the people are still not even in possession of the land yet. But when the king takes the throne of the kingdom, he will make a copy of this law written for him. And in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, they actually didn't call it a copy. They called it to Deuteronom Deuteronomion easy for me to say, which literally means the second law. So that is where our title Deuteronomy comes from. It's from this phrase here, the idea that this book is the second law. As Nick said, it uh, contains a lot of material that is very similar to what we find in some of the earlier books, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And it's kind of given a second time, but with its own unique theological lens applied to it. Just for, for everybody's edification, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was familiar to a lot of your New Testament authors, is called that. The tradition is that in Alexandria, the Jewish community there wanted a translation of the Bible made into Greek because people were losing the ability to speak Hebrew and everybody spoke Greek. So they hired or they brought in 70 people to translate and each of the scholars independently prepared a translation of the Hebrew scriptures. And when they came together and compared them all, all 70 translations were identical. And they said, this is proof that God is really at work in what we're doing here. Septuaginta is Greek for 70 and you will often see the abbreviation, uh, the Roman numeral 70 there, LXX, as an abbreviation for the Septuagint. So if you are reading something and there is a footnote and it says LXX something or other, that means they have gone to the Greek text, the Septuagint, for, um, for understanding. Because we only have one thing that was written in Hebrew, which is the Hebrew scriptures, but we have thousands and thousands of thousands of documents in Greek. 
So we have a much better ability to troubleshoot phrases that are difficult in Greek. So sometimes they'll go to the Greek translation and they're working on the assumption that the people who translated it had a better knowledge of Hebrew, of ancient Hebrew, than we do today. So now you know. Um, this is how we ended up with a book called Deuteronomy. Question. The Septuagint, yes. Septuagint, is that only the translation of the five books or all 39 books? It is the whole, whole of what we call the Old Testament. Yes, all 39 books. Okay, thank you. So, um, obviously, we want to touch on authorship. If we have an idea of who wrote it, it helps us understand why they put in the stuff they put in. It helps us understand maybe when it was written, why it addresses certain topics and not others. So authorship matters if we really want to understand a book. Traditionally, the book is attributed to which notable biblical figure? Moses. Moses. Right. So it is one of the five books of Moses, which again are traditionally attributed to him. But from a very early time, people did notice there were some things that didn't quite add up if we wanted to say that Moses wrote this book. And we can see that right off the bat. Uh, Nick, can you share with us, please, chapter one, verse one again, and chapter one, verse five? These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond Jordan in the wilderness on the plain opposite Suk between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazareth, and Diaznab. By the way of Mount Seir, it takes 11 days to reach Kadesh Barnea from Horeb. Verse 5, beyond Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law as follows. Okay. So, yeah, you need to be quiet. So, what is kind of odd about this? If Moses wrote the book, what's the first thing that strikes you as being a little bit unusual? Well, the writing was not invented then. And he can't write about his own death. Hold it, slow down. How many of you, if you were going to write an account of things that happened in your life, you know, Tom, would you start your book by writing, Tom is writing a story about this. Tom started writing this when this happened. Would that strike anybody as odd? A little bit. Little, little bit. It's not unheard of for people to write in the third person. Yeah. Um, but it is kind of odd. Not everybody in the Bible does that, so that's that's a little weird. And another thing that's a little weird. I'm going to try to hand draw a map here because I. Okay, you know what? We're we're going to get crazy here for a minute. I'm going to attempt to pull up a map here. <laughs> um, so bear with me for just a minute. All right, so we're going to pull up the map, and I'm going to attempt the screen share. We we had some challenges with that last week, so all right, here we are. We're we're getting there. Do 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 do. Any time now. All right. All right. Let's zoom in here. Go away. All right. Now, let me come back to Zoom. Let's do a screen share. And I'm going to share this with you. Okay, so do you see the map? Yes. Yes. All right. So here is the land that the people are trying to go to. And over here is where they are at the moment. In fact, they're probably somewhere right in here, if they are close to the foot of Mount Nebo. They're, they're right over here somewhere. This dotted line of the border 
follows the Jordan River, right? Okay. So not only is it weird that it's in third person, these are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness. Mm. Beyond the Jordan in Moab. So Moab is over here. But if the person writing it is describing it as beyond the Jordan, and they are over here, what does that tell us about where the author is? In the, in the new land. Yeah, the person writing it is already over here. So if they are referring to this land west of the Jordan River, if they are here and they want to talk about beyond the river, the other side of the river, that's over here. Did Moses ever enter into the promised land? No. Oh. No. Moses did not enter into the promised land. Uh, as we found out when we were studying uh, numbers, for reasons that are not 100% sure, that you know we can't explain 100%, God said, Moses, you are not crossing into the promised land. So whoever is writing the book seems to be in the promised land, which Moses never was. So geographically, it would seem like the author could not be Moses. Um, Jennifer, let me have you share with us, please, chapter 34, verses 5 through 8. And we'll ask you to unmute. 34, 5 through 8. <clears throat> so Moses, the Lord's servant, died there in the land of Moab, as the Lord had said he would. The Lord buried him in a valley in Moab, opposite the town of Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows the exact place of his burial. Moses was 120 years old when he died. He was as strong as ever, and his eyesight was still good. Um, the people of Israel mourned for him for 30 days in the plains of Moab. What strikes us as odd if Moses was the author of this book? he's dead yeah people yeah as, as nick pointed out earlier people who are dead typically do not write accounts of their own death now conveniently enough people have said well that's not really a problem if moses was a prophet and he had that kind of relationship with god god could have told him this is how it's going to go down make sure you include that in your in your book or perhaps Moses wrote everything up until chapter 34, and then someone like Joshua picked it up and wrote the last chapter, just added it as the appendix or what have you. So, But there again, it's another thing that says it would be kind of surprising if Moses wrote this book. There are some pieces that don't add up. However, there is some evidence within the book of Deuteronomy that might point us in a more fruitful direction. So, Tom, I'm going to ask you to read chapter 1, verse 6, and Mark, I'm going to ask you to read chapter 31, verses 9 through 13, and then I'm going to jump in with those citations from Nehemiah, and then we'll keep going from there. Uh, verse 6. The Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb, saying, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. So, uh, by what other name is Mount Horeb typically known by? Is it Sinai? Right. So, most in a lot of places, it's Mount Sinai. Sinai tends to be what the so this brings us back, and I'm very glad that Nick brought this up. Sinai tends to be the preferred name that the J source uses. That source from 
Judah, the southern half of what be later becomes the divided kingdom. So you have the southern half centered around Judah. Horeb is the preferred name of the E source, the Ephraim source that comes from the northern end of Israel. So right there, we can see they're using some vocab that is common to authors from the northern half of Israel. And that, of course, that division happens long after Moses. But right there at the beginning, you can start to see that. Um, Mark, can you share with us chapter 31, verses 9 through 13? Sure. Then Moses wrote down this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. Moses commanded them every seventh year in the scheduled year of remission during the festival of booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and children, as well as, your, as well as the aliens residing in your towns, so that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and to observe diligently all the words of this law, and so that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you are crossing over the Jordan to possess. So who, who is given the responsibility so that the people may know the law? Not, not just any priests. Which particular ones? The priests, the... Sons of Levi. Yeah. The Levites have this particular responsibility. Not the Aaronic priests, not the descendants of Aaron, uh, who were the... Sorry, I heard some noises coming from under the bed. Um, not the descendants of Aaron who turn into the Jerusalem priests. So the Levites, and remember, the Levites are kind of spread geographically throughout Israel. They're not given their own, own territory. They are given several cities all throughout the Promised Land uh, so that there can be worship throughout uh, all across the Promised Land. But it's the Levites, not the Jerusalem priesthood who are given the special responsibility of teaching this law, this book, this word to God's people. So that's also kind of interesting. We actually see, so there's this commandment given here in Deuteronomy. We actually see that implemented in the book of Nehemiah. So let me share that with you. And before I do that, let me just share a little bit of context. Nehemiah is the story of what happens after the exile. The people have been taken to Babylon. I'm um, turning to Nehemiah chapter 8 here, by the way. The people have been taken to Babylon, and then Cyrus came in and wasted the Babylonians and said, all of you peoples who had been taken here to Babylon, go ahead, go back to wherever you came from, do your thing under the watchful eyes of my governors. So some of these people were from Judah, and they go back to Jerusalem, and they are trying to rebuild the temple and restart faithful worship of God. And they come across this commandment, we got to read the book of the law every seven years, and this is the account of what happens when they do that. Uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 3 to begin with. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the book, the law, before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. So there's the commandment. Here's the people fulfilling the commandment. Great. We jump a little bit further down there to verse 9. Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, 
said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. So again, which are the people who kind of take the lead in sharing the teaching of the book of the law? Levites. Right. So again, even though we are in Jerusalem, even though we are trying to get the temple back up and running again, it is not the Jerusalem priesthood. It is the Levites. Very interesting. And again, this idea that there is joy, that God's teaching is being read, that notion of, of the joy of being able to have this wonderful revelation from God is, is really beautiful to me. So was that about 500 BC? Yes. Yeah, it would have been, oh, somewhere on here, I have the dates of the Babylonian exile. Yes, the Babylonian exile ended in 539 BC. So yeah, this would have been somewhere, you know, 520s BC, something like that. Um, if I were to look at it more closely, there's probably some, you know, in blank year of so-and-so's reign, and we could date it a little more precisely. But yes, somewhere around the 500 BC mark, yes. So, um, pardon me just a moment. I have company. Anyway, um, yeah, this is somewhere around 500 BC, yes. So I want to start and look at another couple of verses that I think might point us in a particular direction on authorship. Uh, so we'll go ahead and start back up at the top of the list I have on the side of my screen. Carol, if you could share with us, please, 33, verse 7. Nick, if you could be ready with 33, verses 8 through 11. And Jennifer, if you could be ready with 33... 13 through 17. And this he said of Judah, O Lord, give heed to Judah and bring him to his people. Strengthen his hands for him and be a help against his adversaries. And of Levi. So, and of Levi, go ahead, go ahead. And of Levi, he said, give to Levi your thumb and your Urim to your loyal loyal one, whom you tested at Massa, with whom you contend at the waters of Meribah, who sent for his father and mother, I regard them not. He ignored his skin and did not acknowledge his children, for they observed your word and kept your covenant. The teach. Jacob, your ordinances, and Israel, your law, they place incense before you, and hold burnt offerings on your altar. Bless, O, o Lord, his substance, and accept the work of his hands. Curse the loins of his adversaries, of those that hate him, so that they do not rise again. That's an awfully specific curse there. Crush the loins of his adversaries. And uh, Jennifer, what do we have there uh, starting at verse 13? About the tribe of Joseph, he said, May the Lord bless their land with rain and with water from under the earth. May their land be blessed with sun-ripened fruit, rich with the best fruits of each season. 
May their ancient hills be covered with choice fruit. May their land be filled with all that is good. Blessed by, blessed by the goodness of the Lord, who spoke from the burning bush. May these blessings come to the tribe of Joseph, because he was the leader among his brothers. Joseph has the strength of a bull, the horns of a wild ox. His horns are Manasseh's thousands and Ephraim's ten thousands. With them, he gores the nations and pushes them to the ends of the earth. So in verse seven, we have a blessing of Judah. Judah is the central tribe of the southern kingdom, correct? In fact, later we call the land, the land of Judea, which comes from Judah. It is the uh, King David is of the tribe of Judah and his dynasty. So we have here a blessing of Judah, which is how many verses long? More. We have one verse of blessing for Judah. We already talked about how the Levites seem kind of important in this book. The blessing of in 33, 8 through 11, we have a blessing of Levi and his people, the Levites, which is how many verses long? Four. Yeah, we got four verses of blessing. It is four times longer than the blessing for Levi. And I mean, if you are if you are in Judaism, there's not too much you can say that is much higher praise than they teach Jacob your ordinances, they teach Israel your law. That idea of these are the people who are kind of the guardians of, of God's teaching. I mean, it, it does not get much more, it doesn't get much better than that. And then we get to 13 through 17. We have a blessing of which tribe there in 13 through 17? Joseph. Right. We have a blessing of Joseph, who is kind of the central tribe in the northern kingdom. And how many verses of blessing does Joseph get? Five. Joseph gets five. Yeah, so there's a lot more blessing for the Levites and for the most important tribe in the northern part of the country. But there, so, is no, there is no tribe of Joseph, right? Joseph's tribe was split into the two of his sons. Ephraim and Manasseh, yes. Yeah, okay. So the, the two of them together are the, the key tribe up in the north, yes. But the for for our purposes, we can see that the Levites and there seems to be a lot of influence of the, the northern part of Israel here. We also find out there is a lot of overlap thematically between Deuteronomy and the prophet Hosea. The prophet Hosea was active in the northern kingdom of Israel. Deuteronomy has a lot to say about getting rid of the worship of Baal and of discerning who are faithful prophets. Both of these are much more pressing topics in the north than they are in the south. This evidence points us to the author or authors of Deuteronomy being what kind of people from where? The north. Right. So... There's a really good chance that they are not just from the north, but that they are Levites from the north. So that would explain some of the emphases in Deuteronomy that maybe didn't seem as important to people in the southern part of the country. Uh, it would explain why the Levites are lifted up in many places as having key roles and being very important. Um, so that there's a good chance that that the book is written by Levites from the northern part of the kingdom. So, so the northern part, northern part disappeared in 720 BC. 
So this is before yep. that, about 800 BC. Um, hold that thought. That that will come into play later. That that interplay between what happens to the northern kingdom and what happens to the southern kingdom. That that I think will bring us to our our kind of final best guess as to the origin of the book. But yes, you are you are absolutely on to something. The fact that the northern kingdom uh, does not survive as long as the southern kingdom, um, I think we can see evidence of that in the book. Um, hold on just a moment here. We're going to pause for just. He was totally off now. Yeah, hold on. I'll, I'll be right back. Okay. So, um, as is often the case, nothing is quite that simple. It's not just as simple as, well, hey, it's got to be written by some Levites from the Northern Kingdom. Why is it not that simple? Well, I'm glad you're thinking that because we're going to jump right into it. Uh, let's see. Let's go ahead. Tom, would you be ready with Chapter 4, verses 25 through 31? Mark, if you can be ready with 28, 47 through 52, and I will be ready with chapter 30, verses 1 through 5. Okay, from chapter 4, uh, when, when you have had children and children's children and become complacent in the land, if you act corruptly by making an idol in the form of anything thus doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God and provoking him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. You will not live long on it, but it will be utterly destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples. Only a few of you will be left among the nations where the Lord will lead you. There you will serve other gods made by human hands, objects of wood and stone that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. From there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and soul. In your distress, when all these things have happened to you in time to come, you will return to the Lord your God and heed him. Because the Lord your God is a merciful God, he will neither abandon you nor destroy you. He will not forget the covenant with your ancestors that he swore to them. Okay, uh, we'll go through, we'll read all these, and then we'll come back and pick up the pieces. Mark, what do we see there in chapter 28? And we'll have you unmute yourself to share. My space bar wasn't working there. Uh, let's see. Okay. <laughs> because you did not serve the Lord your God joyfully and with gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and lack of everything. He will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation from far away from the end of the earth to swoop down on you like an eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand, a grim-faced nation showing no respect to the old or favor to the young. It shall consume the fruit of your livestock and the fruit of your ground until you are destroyed, leaving you neither grain, wine, and oil, nor the increase of your cattle and the issue of your flock until it has made you perish. It shall besiege you in all your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout your land. It shall besiege you in all your towns throughout the land that the Lord your God has given you. It is not all gloom and doom. By the time we get to chapter 30, we hear this. 
when all these things have happened to you, the blessings and the curses that I have set before you, if you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, and you and your children obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, just as I am commanding you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you, gathering you again from all the peoples among whom the Lord your God has scattered you. Even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land that your ancestors possessed, and you will possess it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. So, if we had to summarize the chain of events that is explained uh, very succinctly in chapter 4, and then is given in much more graphic detail in chapter 28 and chapter 30, how would we summarize this, this series of events? There seems to be a foretelling of of um, people um, going away from God, deviating from the commandments, being punished, yeah, so, being punished, and then coming back. Yeah. So the people are unfaithful to God. A foreign power comes in and conquers the people, takes them away. While they are in exile, the people repent. God remembers the covenant and God returns the people to the land. Does that, does that storyline sound familiar from anywhere else? In Nehemiah. <laughs> Right, yeah, Nehemiah comes in at the very end of that. This is exactly what happened to the people of the southern kingdom of Judah. These passages, if you turn to your handout there, these passages seem to very accurately reflect and theologically interpret the situation of the Babylonian exile, which only affected the southern kingdom of Judah because, as Nick pointed out, the northern kingdom was long gone by the time this happened. So that's kind of weird. If it was written by Levites from the north, it's kind of weird that there's these things that really interpret things that happen to the southern kingdom. But the most well-known problem with the idea that Deuteronomy was written in the northern kingdom of Israel actually comes to us from the book of 2 Kings. Carol, can I have you get ready there with 2 Kings 16, 10 through 16? Nick, if I could have you ready with 2 Kings 22, 8 through 13. Uh, da, 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 da. Jennifer, if you could be ready with 2 Kings 23, 1 through 14. And Tom, if you could be ready with 2 Kings 23, 21 through 25. So uh, everyone go ahead and pause after your... Uh, passage there, and we'll analyze a little bit. When King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet King Tiglath Pileser of Assyria, he saw the altar that was at Damascus. King Ahaz sent to the priest Uriah a model of the altar and its patterns exact in all its details. The priest Uriah built the altar in accordance with all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. Just so did the priest Uriah build it before King Ahaz arrived from Damascus. When the king from came from Damascus, the king viewed the altar. Then the king drew near to the altar went up on it and offered his burnt offering and his grain offering, poured his drink offering 
and dash the blood of his offerings of well-being against the altar. The bronze altar that was before the Lord, he removed from the front of the house, from the place between his altar and the house of the Lord. And he put it on the north side of his altar. King Ahaz commanded the priest Uriah saying, upon the great altar, offer the morning burnt offering and the evening grain offering and the king's burnt offering and his grain offering with the burnt offering of all the people of the land, their grain offering and their drink offering. Then dash against it all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice. But the bronze altering altar shall be for me to inquire by. The priest Uriah did everything that King Ahaz commanded. So uh, it sounded a little bit like we were back in Leviticus there with all the details about the offerings there. So King Ahaz goes, Ahaz is king of Judah, and he goes where to meet with the king of Assyria? Damascus. He goes to Damascus. He is definitely outside of the promised land. And while he is in Damascus, he sees what that he thinks is just the bee's knees? An altar. Yeah, he sees an altar in Damascus and goes, this thing's the best. <laughs> if this altar is built in Damascus, what are our thoughts about what God it might be in honor of? Baal. Possibly Baal, possibly someone else. Not the God of Abraham, correct? Correct. So we have an altar built to another God, and Ahaz says, this altar is where it's at. In fact, I want you to build me one exactly like it in the temple in Jerusalem. Not only that, we remember from reading Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, God gives very specific instructions about how you can approach God to worship. So Ahaz disregards all that, says the bronze altar that Torah called for, uh, pick that up and get it out of the way so I can put this awesome altar to some other God in the temple. And all of the people's offerings are supposed to go on this altar to the other God, and the altar that is supposed to be there for the God of Abraham, he says, yeah, put that in the back. That'll be like my private altar that I can use. So um, Ahaz has really opened the floodgates on worship practices that are not okay according to any part of scripture. So Ahaz has kind of just wrecked the temple and the worship practices of the people. This is bad news. All right. Are, are you with me so far? Yes. Yep. Good, 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 good. Nick, what do we find out happens a generation or two later in 2 Kings 22? The high priest Hilkah said to Shehan, the secretary, I have found a book of law in the house of the Lord. When Hilkah gave the book to Stephan, he read it. Then Shephan, the secretary, came to the king and reported to the king, your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workers who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Shephan, the secretary, informed the king, the priest Hilkah has given me a book. Shephan then read it, aloud to the, read it aloud to the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded the priest Hilkah, Ahikam, the son of Shephan, Hbor, son of Micaiah, Shephan, the secretary, and the king servant of Isaiah, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all of Judah, 
concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because of our ancestor did not obey the words of his book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So Hilkiah, the priest, is in the temple and he finds this book of the law. Now, interestingly enough, the secretary goes to the king and says, uh, you know, we emptied out the, the coffers, you know, with any money we found, we made sure that went to where it's supposed to go. It uh, went to the house of the Lord. By the way, uh, Hilkiah found a book and uh, do you want me to read it to you? So Josiah says, yeah, let's hear what this book says. When the king heard the words of the book, he tore his clothes. The wrath of God is kindled against us because our ancestors did not obey the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So they find this book of the law and they are melting down because when they read the book and they look at what's going on around them, they realize we are so far from what God has told us to do. This is not in any way, shape, or form okay. And the general consensus among scholars is that this book of the law they are talking about is the book of Deuteronomy. So we have the book. It is found in the temple, which is in Judah, the southern part of Israel. And then... Let's see what, what happens next. And this is a little bit longer of a passage, so I tell you what. Jennifer, let me have you read chapter 23, verses 1 through 7. And then, Tom, let me have you jump in with 8 through 14. We'll split that up. And then, Mark, I'll have you jump in on uh, 23, uh, verses 21 through 25. 1 through 7? Yes. Yes. King Josiah summoned all the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, and together they went to the temple, accompanied by the priests and the prophets and all the rest of the people, rich and poor alike. Before them, all the king read aloud the book, whole book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple. He stood by the royal column and made a covenant with the Lord to obey him, to keep his laws and commandments with all his heart and soul, and to put into practice the demands attached to the covenant as written in the book, and all the people promised to keep the covenant. Then Josiah ordered the high priest Hilkiah, his assistant priests and the guards on duty at the entrance of the temple to bring out of the temple all the objects used in the worship of Baal, of the goddess Asherah, Asherah, and of the stars. The king burned all these objects outside the city near Kidron Valley, and then the ashes were taken to Bethel. He removed from the office the priests that the kings of Judah had ordained to offer sacrifices on the pagan altars in the cities of Judah and in places near Jerusalem. All the priests who offered sacrifices to Baal, to the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars. He removed from the temple the symbol of the goddess Asherah, took it out of the king city to Kidron Valley, burned it, pounded its ashes to dust, and scattered it over the public burying ground. He destroyed the living quarters in the, in the temple occupied by the temple prostitutes. It was there that women wove robes used in the worship of Asherah. He brought all the priests out of the towns of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had made offerings from Geba to Beer Shaba. He broke down the high places of the gates that were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city which were on the left at the gate of the city. The priests of the high places, however, 
did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but ate unleavened bread among their kindred. He defiled Topeth, which is in the valley of Ben Hinnom, so that no one would make a son or a daughter pass through fire as an offering to Molech. He removed the horses that the king of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance to the house of the Lord by the chamber of the eunuch, Nathan Melech, which was in the precincts. Then he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. The altars on the roof of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars that Manesh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He pulled down from there and broke in pieces and threw the rubble into the Wadi Kodron. The king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem to the south of the Mount of Destruction, which King Solomon of Israel had built for Astarte, the abomination of the Sidonians, for Jemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. He broke the pillars in pieces, cut down the sacred poles, and covered the sites with human bones. So, and you know, it goes on like that, um, you know, several more verses there, but he does all of this according to what is written in the book. And remember, Deuteronomy has a lot to say about getting rid of worshiping other gods. And just to look at this, Look, look at the sheer amount of worship of other gods that is going on here. Uh, we've got vessels for worshiping Baal in the temple. Uh, we've got priests who are worshiping Baal, the sun, the moon, the heavens. Um, there's an image of Asherah in the temple. Uh, we've got some temple prostitutes in there doing what they do. Um, you know, we, we are getting rid of the places where people would make offerings to Molech. We're pretty sure that um, people sacrificed children to Molech. Molech is a bad, bad deity to worship. Josiah is totally in the right getting rid of worshiping Molech. Um, you know, and it, it just goes on and on. The extent to which there is all of this worship of other gods and he wipes it all out based on the guidance of the book, Deuteronomy. Um, Mark, can you give us the, the brief follow-up there, uh, kind of the tail end of chapter 23? The king commanded all the people, keep the Passover to the Lord your God as prescribed in this book of the covenant. No such Passover had been kept since the days of the judges who judged Israel even during all the days of the kings of Israel and of the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was kept to the Lord in Jerusalem. Moreover, Josiah put away the mediums, wizards, teraphim, idols, and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, so that he established the words of the law that were written in the book that the priest Hilkiah had found in the house of the Lord. Before him, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. So there is further implementation. The king says, not only are we going to celebrate the Passover, we're going to celebrate the Passover as outlined in the book of the law that we have found. So there's a lot of things that point to that northern authorship, particularly by Levites in the north. However, we see some things in the book that seem to interpret what has happened to the southern kingdom and other sources within scripture. Remember that Lutheran teaching. It's I don't believe it's unique to Lutherans, but I know that the Lutherans really believe in it. Scripture interprets scripture. The teachings of the book of Deuteronomy seem to be 
most faithfully implemented in the southern kingdom of Judah. So if you're still following along on our handout, the wrinkle with the idea of northern authorship is that the book appears to be discovered in the southern kingdom of Judah and put into practice there. So we've got we've got marks of two different camps of people having something to do with with this book. So now if you're wondering, well, Eric, what do we do with that? Guess what? I have some thoughts on that. And these thoughts are not my own. This is the result of study and preparation that I did. Um, so kind of the, the theory that we're going to work with, uh, if you find it convincing and faithful, great. Uh, that will make life a little bit easier over the next several weeks. Uh, if you don't buy it, that's okay too. Um, but I hope you will. So uh, there is evidence that the bulk of Deuteronomy, kind of the core, the original content of Deuteronomy was roughly chapters 5 through 26. That seems to have been written by the Levites in the Northern Kingdom. So this comes back to what Nick said earlier about the timeline. When the Northern Kingdom fell, when Assyria came in and picked up those 10 tribes and scattered them all across their empire, these Levites fled to the Southern Kingdom and they took their book with them priests and scholars in the southern kingdom added some material that spoke to their experience and they might have even added a little bit while they were in exile in babylon we know that a lot of what we have of scripture was written down during that period of the exile people were no longer in the land where the things happened that would help them remember the stories and so they said, we want to make sure we write this down. This stuff is important. It matters. Everybody needs to know it. So the bulk of the book seems to be from that Levite, uh, those Levite authors from the Northern Kingdom. But because they brought it with them to the Southern Kingdom, there was some influence by people in the Southern Kingdom. And it was in the Southern Kingdom that the ideas of the book were implemented to their greatest extent under Josiah. Let me stop there. Questions, comments, insights? Does anybody hear that notion of kind of where the book came from and is just going, no, Eric, you're completely off your rocker? Not At least with, res with respect to this. I, I could be completely off my rocker for other things, but just, just limited to this. Makes perfect sense. It's written over a period of 100 years by different authors. Beautiful. I love it. So if this understanding of authorship is correct, in spite of the fact that people are writing in different places under different circumstances, the one overarching theme that pulls it all together is that the authors are looking in the face of domination by other nations and by extension, other gods. Remember, it's not just a matter of this country's military is more powerful than that country's military. If you get defeated in a war, it's because your enemy's gods are bigger and badder than your gods. So there is this domination by other nations and in theory by other gods. If you are a people who only worships one God and is beginning to get this idea that there aren't actually any other gods, the book emphasizes faithful worship of Yahweh as a way to maintain the people's autonomy and help them stay faithful to the God who has delivered them from Egypt. So it's a way that the people can maintain who they are as God's people it's a way that they can stay faithful to that God, even in the face of threats from other countries. 
they can still worship God faithfully. If that is, if this idea of authorship holds, so to come back to what we touched on quite a bit earlier, the core of the book would have been written kind of in the first half of the 600s BC, so sometime between 700 and 640 BC. We are pretty sure that most of it was written by 640, because that is when Josiah's reign began, and that is when the teachings of the book were really implemented. So we're pretty sure most of the it was probably started in the northern kingdom before it fell. It was probably complete around the year 640, because it would have been available to guide his reforms. And in the form we have it, there's a very good chance it came together during that Babylonian exile. So there may have been one final, um, it may have been passed down somewhat by oral tradition, or it may have been kind of reshaped and reformed during that time in Babylon. So we're looking at probably the mid, mid to late 600s BC for when this book came together in a form we would recognize it and in the form we have it probably the mid 500s BC so so the I'm, I'm just trying to put a historical reference here so so the north fell when around in, in, in the around 700. 722 BC. 722 BC. Right. Okay. And then, so the Levites, some escape to the south and, and bring the first 25 chapters or so. Right. But then Josiah, things still don't seem very good around, around um, even in the southern kingdom, because Josiah comes in and is trying to clean up the house get mm -hmm. the house in order and and apparently did so uh, to a degree but then within another few decades came the babylonian exile so that obvious the the reform didn't last very long i mean is that kind of the way things were i mean it, it kind of sounds mm -hmm. like the the tribes of israel both north and south were horrendous for the better part of a, two centuries. So we're going to spend quite a bit more time with, with that when we talk about the theology of Deuteronomy. What is it that they are trying to tell us about God? Uh, and I think that will help inform our understanding a little more. But the thing I want to make sure I point out here is that Part of what's going on in this book is these people are trying to make sense of their experience. However, the experience of idolatry is in no way, shape, or form unique to Israel or Judah. That is common to all people. And I think Luther sums some of these things up really well uh, in the large catechism luther talks about the idea that anything you really anything your heart trusts completely is your god so here in uh sorry i'm pointing at my bible over here you can't see it so in the book of kings in second kings here when they're talking about idolatry they are really talking about idols. They are talking about objects used in the worship of other gods. We've got Asherah, we've got Astarte, we've got Baal, all the, all the regular usual suspects. That idea of idolatry, it's not about Israel and Judah. It's about humanity. We as people still struggle with idolatry. Typically, in, in our context, it is not that we are 
setting up objects to worship another god, but there are things that we pursue, there are things that we serve, there are things that we really put the kind of trust in that rightfully is only reserved for God. So in a sense, it's the the language and customs around it are very different from what we experience, but that idea of idolatry, that idea of putting our trust in something other than God, of putting something else in God's place, that is definitely alive and well in us. Uh, whether it is money, that is probably the number one thing that tries to take God's place. We're in a moment in our society where being famous for the sake of being famous, people will do anything to get attention. Uh, you know, how many people retweeted my thing? How many people watched my TikTok? Um, and so on and so on and so on. You, you name it, people can make an idol of it. People can say, this is what I serve. This is ultimately what my heart trusts. So, um, yeah, I think it's very clear from the, the scriptural record that there were a lot of people in Israel and a lot of people in Judah who came up short in terms of being faithful to the God of Abraham. And they're, they're very upfront about that in, in the Old Testament. But we should not for a moment think that is unique to them. Like, oh, pff, look at those people. Look how, look how bad they were. Uh, no, dude, that's, that's us too. We might not call it Asherah or Astarte, but we too struggle with putting other things in the place reserved only for God. So the idea of of idolatry being a problem, um, I think if we were to swap out some of the language, it would speak to us very clearly in our current situation. That is my theologizing for the night. So in short, yes. Some of the people in this book were not doing a good job, but we can learn from it because we're doing a lot of the same things. Boom. Very good. <laughs> On that happy note, other questions, insights, comments, concerns? Okay. As I told by a group this morning, after 13 years of doing this, I'm, I'm finally getting to the point where I have a good idea of the, the correct amount of material, material for, for one class session. So, yay me. <laughs> Let us, uh, why don't we go ahead and close our time together tonight praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy okay. kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. You are very welcome. And uh, we will see everybody again soon. Great. A, good night. Good night. Good, good, good night. Right. Hector's still care. there. Good night to you, too. <laughs> oh, he, he, he was taken up to bed. Okay. <laughs> right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.